we're looking at the chronic adaptations that occur within the aerobic system and we're also looking at that specifically with regards to the body system, the muscular system. So what we've got here is just a brief outline of the adaptations that occur and this is from a general sense, both anaerobic and aerobic can come under this here. So changes adaptations are changes that occur as a result of stress and what the body does is it allows it to cope with further stress. The adaptations are going to be specific to the type of training that is undertaken. You get out what you put in. It occurs within the three body systems. So that refers to the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, and the muscular system. However, there's going to be more with some of the body systems, depending on the type of training that you undertake. Basically, the body becomes more efficient. The work is going to be easier as a result of adaptation. And that's allowing the body to further cope with stress, as outlined in point one. Adaptations are reversible and that old saying, if you don't use it, you lose it, certainly applies here. And interestingly, aerobic loss is faster than anaerobic loss and overload must be applied correctly to achieve gain. So it must be applied at the peak of overcompensation in order to achieve the gains that are wanted. So that's just a general outline of the concept or the principle of adaptation. When we're talking about it specifically to the aerobic system now, what we want to see is we want to see the body becoming more efficient. And an example of this, although it's not specifically linked to the muscular system here, but this concept of efficiency is really important. So as a result of aerobic training, the athlete is going to have a lower resting and a lower submaximal heart rate to achieve the same cardiac output. And this is due to a greater stroke volume. Now, the greater stroke volume is due to an increase in total blood volume. It's, it's due to an increase in the size of the left ventricle. Um, so some of these factors that are tying into that efficiency concept. The body also becomes more economic as well, and that's an important term. This term's popped up in the last couple of exams, and what it means is that less energy is expended or required to perform at the same speed or the same pace. And sometimes we talk about this in terms of a percentage of heart rate. Sometimes we talk about it in terms of a percentage of VO2. So let's just take a little bit, still on those same points, let's take a look at a question, question 12 from the 2010 exam. And you can see that term economy is used or utilized within this question. The economy of an athlete was measured on a treadmill at 14 kilometers per hour before and after engaging in several months of endurance training. So that's aerobic training. An improvement in economy would be revealed by, and if we have a look at these points here, it's certainly not gonna, we're not talking about at maximal 14 kilometers per hour. It, it speaks nothing of maximal. So A is certainly not the answer because it's not going to increase the VO2 max of the athlete. It's certainly not going to result in increase in VO2, which is oxygen uptake recorded at 14 kilometers per hour. In fact, the body will be better at utilizing the oxygen that's available. So that's certainly not an answer. A decrease in energy expenditure is what we would be looking at for that answer there. So a decrease in energy expenditure, and that's tied in with becoming economic. Less energy is expended to perform at the same speed or pace. The body becomes more economic and more efficient, and it's certainly not going to increase in energy expenditure because that would be completely the opposite of the adaptations that we are talking about. If we now refer specifically to the muscular system within aerobic adaptations, let's take a little bit of a closer look at the role of the muscular system and what changes in order to make it more efficient and more economic. So we know that the muscular system, when referring specifically to aerobic ATP production, is responsible for the utilization of oxygen and also fuel. And we talk about fuel from carbohydrates, fats, and proteins as the food fuel, or as glycogen, triglyceride, um, on amino acids as the chemical fuel or the body fuel to produce ATP. Now, with adaptations that occur as a result of training, it's going to enhance the utilization of this fuel. So with changes such as increase in enzymes and increase in fuel storage, that production of ATP via the fuel is going to be enhanced. Adaptations also occur to increase the oxygen extraction from the blood. So the myoglobin, which is responsible from taking the oxygen from the blood and it's delivered to the muscles via the red blood cells or hemoglobin, increase in, in number. And that means that you're going to have an increased ability to extract oxygen from the blood. Tied in further with this is the concept of capillarization as well. With more capillaries to the muscle site, you're going to have a greater opportunity for diffusion. 
and those myoglobin are going to be able to extract more and they're going to be able to extract more efficiently. We're also going to have an increase in removal of metabolic byproducts so that it can be taken back to the core part of the body for central processing. This increase in aerobic ATP production results in the body being more efficient. So we've talked about this now a couple of times here, and we're talking about lower resting and submaximal heart rate and faster recovery, and the body can work at a higher intensity for longer. And working at a higher intensity for longer aerobically means that we're going to delay lactate inflection point, which we know occurs as a result of training. We get a right shift with our lactate inflection point. I thought it might be appropriate at this time to just reflect a little bit on the different types of muscle fibers that we have. And you'll know that we have three, essentially three types. We've got slow twitch fibers and then fast twitch fibers can be divided into type 2A and type 2B. So type 2A can take on some characteristics of slow twitch muscles and type 2B we call purely anaerobic and they tend to be used for that high intensity explosive exercise. What I've got here is just, I've characterized them into slow twitch versus fast twitch. So if we're looking at aerobic versus anaerobic fibers, and what I want you to do now is I want you to pause this slide here and I want you to go through and try and fill out that table with regard to the characteristics of the muscle type. So for example, if we do the first one together, myoglobin, there's a high level of myoglobin in the slow twitch fibers because they are responsible for predominantly aerobic ATP, whereas fast twitch, which are recruited preferentially for anaerobic training, are going to have a low level of myoglobin. So pause now, fill out this, and then we'll move on. So what you should have is you should have these characteristics and let's just go through a few of them. So the first one we've talked about, ATPA, so the enzyme responsible for fast breakdown. You're gonna have a higher level in fast twitch fibers. Triglyceride stores, um, of course, that's the fuel used by the aerobic system. So you'll have high in slow twitch and low in fast twitch. Oxidative enzymes, again, high in slow twitch and low in fast twitch, as well as capillary density. The capillaries are bringing the oxygen to the muscle, so the fast twitch fibers are going to have a low capillary density. In terms of CP stores, fast twitch, the ATP CP system, is an energy system that's responsible for maximal explosive exercise, so fast twitch we're going to be much higher. And mitochondria, higher in slow twitch. That's the aerobic ATP production factory, if you like, um, that's going to increase as a result of training and it's going to aid in our efficiency and our economy. In terms of contraction speed, slow twitch contract at a slow rate and fast twitch at a fast rate. Now our glycogen stores, because the slow twitch aerobic system uses glycogen as a fuel and fast twitch use glycogen as a fuel for the anaerobic glycolysis system, they're both gonna be reasonably high in terms of their storage. If we wanna have a look at the summary here of the aerobic adaptations for the muscular system, We've got this, this is taken from the Macmillan textbook and it's got the changes that occur as a result of training and the benefits. We want you to go a little bit further with these benefits and these are fantastic that we've got. But what we really want you to say is not only the benefits in terms of what changes physiologically, but what happens to the outcome? What happens to the performance? So for example, if we're looking at, let's say, mitochondria. So more sites available to produce ATP, leading to more ATP produced aerobically. And the body is going to be able to work at a higher intensity for longer as a result of an increase in mitochondria, not just the number, but also the size. So I like to think of it in terms of the factories of ATP production. So if you've got more factories and the factories are bigger, you're going to be able to produce more ATP. With oxidative enzymes, and we know enzymes are proteins that catalyze reactions or that speed up reactions or turbocharge reactions is a good way of thinking about it. If we've got more enzymes, we're going to have a faster breakdown of food fuel, which means we're going to be able to produce energy at a faster rate aerobically, which means that we're going to be able to use the aerobic system at a higher intensity for longer. And this is linked back to lactate inflection point as well. We know lactate inflection point is the highest steady state that we can hold aerobically when lactate production is matched by lactate clearance. So if we're able to delay our lactate inflection point, we're going to be able to work at a higher intensity for longer. If you look specifically at triglyceride stores, 
If we've got more fat stores within our muscle, then that means that we're going to have more available energy via triglyceride. And what that means is that we're able to utilize triglyceride at a higher intensity. This in turn means that we're going to be able to spare our glycogen for much higher intensity efforts. So triglyceride stores lead to a glycogen sparing concept where you're able to use that vital glycogen. Remember, we've only got 90 minutes to two hours worth of glycogen stored in our uh, stores available in our muscle. So we're going to be able to use that triglyceride at a higher intensity because the body's more efficient at breaking it down and we've got more stores there. So that's going to lead to a delay in that glycogen utilization. In terms of intensity, it's important to think about this. So it means that perhaps if we're not as fit, we're going to tap into our glycogen stores at 70% or 100% of our glycogen stores at 70% of our maximum heart rate. But perhaps if we're fitter, we're not going to tap into those glycogen stores until we're at 75% of our maximum heart rate or 80% of our maximum heart rate. So we can use triglyceride at a higher intensity. Obviously, that's going to create some benefits in terms of our power output and in terms of our pace or our exercise, um, the power that we're putting out during our exercise. So if we have a look at this lactate inflection point, you can see that the bottom graph there, post-training, shows a right shift. So lactate inflection point moves. It means that our aerobic system can produce energy at a faster rate. And that means we can use our aerobic system at a higher intensity and for longer. Before we get a buildup of metabolic byproducts and before our body calls on a greater reliance of the anaerobic glycolysis system to produce energy. So if we think about that concept of using triglyceride at a higher intensity, if we are able to do that and spare our glycogen, it means that we're going to be able to work at a greater oxygen consumption using triglyceride before we make the switch to carbohydrate or glycogen as our dominant fuel source. And that in turn is going to shift our lactate inflection point to the right. So it's quite complex, this concept of delayed lactate inflection point but it's all to do with the body becoming more efficient and more economic. So tie it back to these terms and always remember that a higher lactate inflection point, I'll say it again, means that you can work at a higher intensity for longer. If we're looking at this concept of AVO2 difference, which you'll know by now, looks at the difference in oxygen concentration between the arterioles and the venules, or we've got a picture here in arteries and veins, What's going to happen as a result of training is that the body is going to be better at extracting that oxygen from the arterioles. Now it's measured and you can see we've got the arteries and veins there. So it's a measure within the cardiovascular system, but it is in fact a muscular adaptation. And why we get a greater AVO2 difference as a result of training two factors, but predominantly that second factor that we get an increase in myoglobin number and myoglobin is the vehicle that's responsible for extracting oxygen. So if we have more myoglobin, we're going to get a greater oxygen extraction and it also leads to a greater, or we also have a greater capillarization. So that means that we've got, and I've used this analogy um, a few times in terms of servicing the muscle. If we've got one train line servicing the muscle, servicing a train station, for example, and if we're thinking of people as the oxygen, there's only a certain, certain amount of oxygen that can get off with one train line. But if we've got many train lines servicing the station, then we're going to have the opportunity to get many passengers or much oxygen um, off there. So think about it from that sense. It's basically lines that are servicing the muscle, these capillaries. So if you've got more capillaries, greater oxygen delivery, and also we get a decrease in diffusion time as well because of that network of capillaries that are surrounding the skeletal muscle. So if we have a look at some specific questions here, we're looking at cycling, so Cadell Evans, and we, we know straight away even if we're looking at this question without contextual information that it's going to be an aerobic-based question due to the number of kilometres that he's uh, training. So as a result of this aerobic training, Chronic changes occur in Cadell's skeletal muscles, such as an increase in the number of mitochondria. How would an increase in the number of mitochondria within the skeletal muscle assist Cadell's performance? So have a go at answering that one, pause it, and then we'll continue on. 
So an increase in the number, and also don't forget there's an increase in the size, means that there's going to be greater opportunity for breaking down or oxidizing fuel, which means that there's going to be a greater opportunity for aerobic ATP production. And it's just for one mark, so that's all you would need. And then you would need to identify another chronic effect of aerobic training in the muscles and describe how it assists performance. So it's worth two marks, one mark for identifying and then one mark for explaining. So the second one, perhaps you might say myoglobin, that's always a favourite of mine in case you haven't realised, oxidative enzymes, glycogen stores, triglyceride stores, and then you would need to go on. Make sure that you pick one that you can explain really well, that's really important. Um, so for example, myoglobin means a greater opportunity to extract oxygen, which increases the availability of oxygen and therefore the ability of the aerobic system to produce ATP. Let's have a look at the answers. So that first one, an increased capacity for aerobic metabolism, so it's oxidizing fuel. And they've listed fatty acids and carbohydrates, which intrigues me a little bit because they've listed one that's a chemical fuel and one that's a food fuel within the same answer. So if we want to be really tight here and really on point, we would say either triglyceride and glycogen or fatty acids and glucose or fats and carbohydrates. But you try and be really specific with your terminology um, there. Don't switch between the two within the one answer. Then the next one, you can see there's lots of different options there that you could put in. Again, just make sure, and they haven't got the explanation there, but just make sure that you're able to explain the use. And if you chose increased use of fats during submaximal exercise, you'd need to go on and explain that that leads to glycogen sparing, which means that you can work at a higher intensity using fats for longer. If we're going on further now, we've got a graph. Aerobic training would also have an effect on Cadell's AVO2 difference. On the graph below, draw a line to represent his AVO2 difference compared to an untrained person. Now, don't forget about um, drawing this particular line. So what do you think? Would Cadell have a greater AVO2 difference or would he have an AVO2 difference that isn't as strong as an untrained person? Remember, he'd have greater capillarization he'd have greater myoglobin. So that line would need to be drawn above the untrained person. And AVO2 difference is a direct measure of the oxygen consumption via the muscles. So you could say that, or you could say it's a measure of the oxygen concentration in the arteries and the veins. So they allowed you to say both of those options um, there. All right, I hope that helped.